because I think this is really special then. I think this is this can be a cornerstone in the history of the project, and also a stepping stone, as Colin said. So it's really, really exciting to be here. And uh, I hope that new energies really will, will help the project to go on living and growing. Uh, then I have prepared something in which I um, answered some objections to the project, just to show uh, how strong is our uh, theoretical ground. And then I wanted to show, uh, to stress how difficult it is it to obtain results on the social level, despite this strong theoretical ground. I think that uh, we are all um, tired, and I, I don't think that to discuss in detail two or three objections would be very helpful now. So I prefer to start directly with a, a brief survey of the situation, a survey which will overlap somehow with what Colin said, because of course we are reasoning about the same situation and the same things. So, in 1997, the British Home Secretary announced a policy no longer to grant licenses for research involving the other graves, stating that the cognitive and behavioral characteristics and qualities of these animals mean it is unethical to treat them as expendable for research. Uh, this is uh, a very important statement, I think, because it's the first uh, uh, implicit overcoming of the species value. Uh, after, after this, uh, subsequently, some countries, New Zealand, the Netherlands, Sweden, Austria, Japan, Ireland, Belgium, announced a ban or a moratorium on human grade research. In 2007, as Paul mentioned, the Parliament of the Balearic Islands, one of the autonomous communities of Spain, announced its approval of a resolution to grant legal rights to great apes. And in 2008, the Spanish Parliament Environmental Committee approved a resolution, the resolution about which Colin said that is in, in a dusty corner in Zapatero's uh, offices, a mm -hmm. resolution or urging the country to embrace the ideas of the Great Day project. All this, albeit innovative and important, and important is still far from the granting of basic human rights to the other great apes, other great apes, because of course we are great apes. Precisely how far it is, it can be shown by two recent and complementary episodes. In October 2007, Johnny, a chimpanzee in his 40s, escaped from his zoo enclosure near London. As soon as he could reach the surrounding green meadows, though he wasn't attacking anyone, Johnny was promptly, promptly shot dead. Of course, no investigation of the shooting board for Johnny obviously remained, according to the law, an item of property. That is why he had been deprived of his freedom, and that is why he could be so lightheartedly deprived of his life. Just in the same year, Martin Bullock, leader of an Austrian Animal Rights Association, applied for guardianship for Matthew Hirsel Pan, a chimpanzee living in a sanctuary in risk of bankruptcy, in order to obtain sorry, legal standing because a benefactor has made uh, Matthew Hirsel sorry, Matthew Hirsel, a donation, and he couldn't receive it without having legal standing. The long-term proposal was to have him legally declared a person by at least 
in Austrian court. All the steps, however, were undertaken to no avail. The judge of the district court rejected the guardianship application. Balk appealed to a provincial court, which dismissed the appeal. An appeal was, was then lodged with the Austrian Supreme Court and was once again dismissed. Finally, the case was appealed to the European Court of Justice with no apparent effect. Why is the pace of change so slow? These are the questions we are all asking. In spite of the manifest groundlessness of the objections coming from, from the defenders of the status quo, in the context of a work on the history of racism, after the claim that the ideas of race were slowly elaborated within vast interdisciplinary sites in the service of Western supremacy, we find the observation, observation that racism is not just an opinion or a prejudice. The suffix ism tells us it is also a doctrine and of quotation. Such considerations clearly hold for speciesism as well. For in speciesism too, and in particular in its quintessential form of human chauvinism, what we are confronting is not individual prejudice, but a doctrine a set of beliefs orienting, orienting moral behavior progressively developed and refined in the service of human supremacy. In this perspective, it's clear that, he, that any yielding to the idea of equality for non-human beings cannot but meet with serious obstacles, as colleagues stressed before. But why doctrines are powerful? They are not inseparable. Peter Singer and others have argued that the revival of practical ethics in the 1970s was closely connected to the rise of the egalitarian movements which aimed at putting moral arguments at the service of emancipatory causes. These movement, movements too had to face ingrained doctrines and they gained some success as the progressive overcoming of racism, racism, sexism, and homophobia shows. Is there reason to believe that the attempt to extend equality beyond humanity can gradually advance along the same path? Some elements appear to point in this direction. As for the theoretical level, it should be noted that some of the very speculative tools of existing or existing doctrines, once free from the biases, can be turned against them, against the existing doctrines. This has been the case with the creed expressed in the American Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal, which the abolition, abolitionist leader William Lloyd Garrison invoked to demand the immediate enfranchisement of the slave population. This is also the case with the present doctrine of human rights. For, notwithstanding the emphatic mention of our species in the level defining this, this cluster of rights, human rights, any sound philosophical formulation of the doctrine, based as must be on the rejection of any form of biologism and perfectionism, Perfectionist is the idea that moral status is connected, linked to the cognitive level of the both beings, cannot embody any structural reference to the possession of a particular genotype or of particular cognitive skills. If, on the other hand, one turns to the social level, a significant aspect is that the primary sphere in which the Great Day Project moves is that of formal equality. And in contrast with material equality, which would require corrective or redistributive interventions, formal equality does not demand any positive action, except, of course, for the removal of 
the obstacles to equal treatment. And if material equality is far from having been achieved in any country of the world, it is generally recognized that formal equality is a realm in which progress has occurred. This fact entitles one to surmise that the attainment of moral reform for the other great age, moral and legal reform for the other great age, may be gradual, but is definitely not precluded. Finally, and more importantly, however, there is an aspect of this further extension of equality whose relevance is of universal interest. In the context of this discussion of the Great Age Project, American philosopher Kelly Wolf makes a significant observation, quotation. It is understandable that traditionally marginalized peoples, and we may have individuals or groups, would be skeptical about calls to surrender the humanist model of, of subjectivity with all the, its privileges at just the historical moment when they are poised to graduate into it. But the larger point is that as long as this humanist and species is the structure of this subjectivization, subjectivization remains intact, the humanist discourse of species will always be available for use by some humans against other humans as well. And here I just refer very briefly to a notion I touched upon in my reply to the objections in the, the section I, I, I skipped. The notion of the humanization of humans is a notion that is used uh, in a context uh, in which non-humans are seen as degraded <coughs> beings and the, the process of dehumanization is a process which is connected with people who think that to be human is to be important uh, in, and, uh, and noble and dignified and to be non-human is to be unworthy of interest, protection and so on. So the idea behind the, the, the notion that certain humans can be dehumanized is the idea of the inferiority of non-humans. This is the core question we must face. What Wolf emphasizes is the connection between the devaluation of non-humans and the devaluation of humans via the traditional derogatory category of the animal. What then, if a change in attitude towards at least some non-humans, in this case the other great apes, could help erase such derogatory aspect, wouldn't this, by undermining the ultimate ideologically constructed notion that from time immemorial is wielded against those who are to be devoured, make for a better moral landscape, a landscape more livable for humans and non-humans alike. We know from past records that the constant process of moral and legal enfranchisement can never be allowed to stop, and that every conquest can gain solidity only by being surpassed by another conquest. It may thus well be that in a globalized world, in which the ethical, ethical advances achieved in some areas are constantly threatened by the penetration of external inequitable creeds and by the resurgence of internal discriminatory doctrines, the best way to protect egalitarian discourse lies in extending it to the other great.